Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone. It's good to see, it's great to see so many people here for our uh, event, which is dedicated to reflecting on and marking 50 years of the introduction of the Equal Pay Act uh, 1970 in the UK. So my name is Maud Bracke. I convened the Centre for Gender History at University of Glasgow together with Jackie Clark. So we, on behalf of Jackie and myself, but also on behalf of Women's History Scotland, who are the co-organizers of this event, again, very warm welcome and already also a very warm thanks to our three uh, panel panelists, panel speakers. I'll just very briefly introduce my two colleagues who are going to take over and are going to chair and coordinate the event. Dr. Valerie Wright, who is currently a research fellow at the University of Stirling, formerly University of Glasgow, and also uh, soon again University of Glasgow, and Dr. Yvonne McFadden, who is currently teaching associate at the University of Strathclyde, but also formerly University of Glasgow. Both, of, uh, both Valerie and Yvonne are also members of the Centre for Gender History and have a very strong interest uh, in their own work, have a very strong interest in questions of gender work and women's work. So without further ado, hand over to uh, Yvonne. Thanks for that introduction, Maud. So moving forward um, today, um, what we're going to do, I'll take you through some housekeeping first. So I know we're all becoming Zoom experts now, but just to let you know, so we're going to be muting everybody. Um, so everyone will be on mute and that's just so we don't have any background noise while we do the round table. Um, also, if you have any questions or comments you want to make throughout the discussion, please pop them into the chat. So we're aiming to have the discussion run until about five o'clock and then at five o'clock we'll take comments and uh, questions from the audience and uh, Valerie is going to run that part of things today. Also, um, if you want to speak your question as well, um, Valerie will give you the opportunity to do that. So it's really up to you whether you want to do that. Um, so to get started, um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just briefly introduce, them, uh, oh, introduce themselves and uh, their interests, I suppose, or research into equal pay or in. So if we want to start with Jennifer. Um, hi everybody, um, thanks so much for the invitation. My name is Jennifer McCary. Um, I'm a trade union organiser with Unison. Um, I'm here because I've had involvement in equal pay and the role of workers organising around equal pay um, probably back to about 2005 when I started working in Unison's equal pay unit um, and primarily I was involved in um, organising um, groups of women workers, particularly classroom assistants, um, around the issue of single status and the, and the um, inquiry that the e um, Equal Opportunities Commission was undertaking into their under the undervaluing of that work. Um, in 2015, I found myself um, working um, with the fabulous Glasgow City branch of Unison, um, primarily focusing on organising um, the workforce of Cordia, um, which um, was an alio um, of Glasgow City Council um, and where it was a kind of hot spot for equal pay claims. Um, we took the audacious, um, I think, and courageous um, move in 2017 to, to, to reach out, building on the um, great partnership we had built with the campaign and um, legal teams of, um, of, of Stephen Cross and Action for Equality to build a joint legal approach. Um, we built on that um, a, a, a joint um, campaign and approach to decide to um, look at equal pay not just from a legal technical um, perspective but also to look at how we could maximise the power of the workforce and involve them in a campaign to um, state their right for pay equality and that resulted in the historical strike in 2018 which eight and a half thousand workers women and men um, across um, Glasgow um, took part in. There was a settlement around that um, and that um, the inequalities still continue and are still being addressed. So um, I've had a really um, big interest for a long time around not just the legal principles of equal pay, but how we actually deliver that for women workers in Scotland. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, if I could now ask Nicole. 
Professor Nicole Busby, if she could introduce herself, please. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I'm Nicole Busby. I'm Professor of uh, Human Rights, Equality and Justice at the University of Glasgow. Um, I've spent my most of my career uh, specialising in equality law, uh, so teaching and researching um, in that area, especially gender equality. Um, so I've written quite a lot on the on the issues of uh, labour market inequality, equal pay, equal treatment, and so on, sex discrimination, uh, and so on. Um, I've also got uh, an interest in this area outside academia. Um, I've been a member of the Equality and Human Rights Commission's uh, Scotland Committee. Um, I'm no longer a member, but I was until last year. Um, I've been a trade union official um, for a number of years, and I'm currently the convener of the Board of Trustees uh, for Close the Gap, which is a specialised organisation in Scotland, which works on women's participation in the labour market. Um, so lots of broad interest, um, some experience, um, and yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation, and I'm really looking forward to this event. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so, Jonathan, uh, Dr. Jonathan Moss, if you could introduce yourself as well, please. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Jonathan uh, Moss, and I'm, a, I'm now a lecturer, a lecturer in um, politics at uh, the University of Sussex. Um, but I did my, my PhD at, at Glasgow um, University, which uh, focused on, it was an oral history project, really focused on um, uh, women's workplace militancy in Britain uh, during the 1970s. And um, one of the, what I really was trying to do is interviewing uh, female workers and trying to understand why they kind of engaged in such action when they did and what the kind of impact had been on, on their subsequent political identities. And uh, one of the main disputes that I focused on was the um, Ford sewing machinist strike in Dagenham in, in 1968, and then again the other one in the 1985s. Um, the 1968 one's obviously connected as being seen as one of the, the key moments that leads to the, the 1970 Equal Pay Act. So I think that's why my research is relevant to, to today's uh, topic. And uh, yeah, I'm just I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much to um, Valerie and Yvonne and Maud for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Um, so now we've met our panellists. Um, I want to, wanted to start off the event basically by um, hearing some of the voices, basically. We want to hear some of the women who've been fighting for equal pay. So we've put together a little presentation um, to hear some voices. I, I will share screen and start that in a moment. So, here we are. So just before we get going, um, so originally we hoped to have this event in person. It was planned for May, um, for the 29th of May to be exact, so that we could have it around about the time that the yet actually was uh, given royal assent. So here we are in November instead, in a very different situation from what we would have been in then. Um, and naturally it's probably quite fitting that we're having it in November because uh, this year's Equal Pay Day will be the 20th of November. Now that's moved from the 14th from last year, so I suppose that's same progress. So just for fun, um, I looked up um, what the average pay gap was in 1970 when the Act was passed and I found a figure of 36.2%. So this is true calculations and I worked out that if they were to have an equal pay day in 1970, that date would have been the 19th of August. So that gives us some indication of, I suppose, what's, how far we've come in the 50 years, but also we are in November. It would be good if equal pay, you know, if we just were the 31st of December. So often when we teach, uh, women's history, we name all the significant acts that change women's lives and equal pay um, is one of the kind of, you know, top, tops the bill. Um, so in honour of its 50th birthday, we thought it would be good to reflect on the bill itself and its impact and then also particularly we want to ask questions about the future of equal pay. So I'm going to start the presentation with um, Agnes McLean. So Agnes McLean was born in Glasgow um, she was born to a socialist family. During the Second World War, Agnes worked at Rolls-Royce Hillington, also in Glasgow, and she and the other women went out twice on strike during the war. The first time she laughs that they had no idea what they were doing, 
But the second time they were more organised and it was a more, I suppose, a clearer dispute about the women being paid less than the men. So I'm going to let Agnes do the summarising. Uh, can I get a thumbs up uh, to let, just let me know if you can hear the sound when we start? When they saw the potential, they allowed them to develop these skills. So as the factory gathered momentum, the skill of the women began to develop and they got more and more skilled and were doing highly skilled work. There were in three categories. There were skilled men, there was semi-skilled men and there was unskilled men and others. And we were the others and we were away below even the, the unskilled. We just didn't know what to do about it, how to deal with it, but we were really very angry because we were working very hard. We just hadn't a clue how to conduct a strike. So we were really lost, but we, we, did, we did put up a bit of a fight. And um, eventually, they, they, you know, they had to look at it and we had to get some recognition for the male labourers' rate. Didn't I? So that was Agnes, and this was the strike she went on for three so we're going to go forward in time and we're going to go to the 1970s and oh, when we talk about women's liberation now and feminism um and this is basically um a video we found of some women talking about the industrial relations bill so this the context is 1970 um and they're talking about this kind of industrial relations bill and um also kind of versus equal pay, I suppose, because both bills are kind of in process or being processed around the same time. That will get equal pay without a terrific struggle, because I believe that they would remove this bill. And under the Industrial Relations Bill, it's made it that much harder for women to find equal <coughs> pay. In any case, they were going to take us five years. They said they couldn't do it in less. They couldn't get a bill through Parliament in less. When it comes to the Industrial Relations Bill, they can do it in six months. I mean, they can rush things through when it's something they want to. It seems to me that it's never going to be the right time for women to get equal pay. And the only way we're ever going to get it is by strike action. I think so far the only people who've achieved equal pay, aside from civil servants, they've had to strike to get it. And uh, this bill, of course, is just going to stop us getting any farther. What are the women going to do to defeat this bill, do you reckon? Well, this is <laughs> well, surely this uh, action you can only take together with the uh, men and whatever yeah, union, yeah, as the yeah, union yeah. decides, or whatever it's you the actual workers. Yeah. It's not men and women, really. It's workers. Well, it affects the workers. We've all got to take action. Yeah, we've got to stand together. There's no point in women standing out on their own as far as the bill's concerned. We've all got to get together on the bill. Well, will the men stand with the women? Uh, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I think they will. I think they will on this. Um, they may not on purely women things. I doubt whether they'd stand with us, for instance, on equal pay. No, 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 no. But for something which uh, is going to be against their own interests, yeah, yes, they'll stand there, obviously, stand with us. Oh, and how much you try. Well, so that raises some interesting issues that maybe we can pick up in discussion. And finally, that will last, get equal pay. Our last clip is from the four Dagenham strikers. Um, I've got some old clips from them as well. We were nervous, but we were determined and nothing was going to stop us from doing it. I'm Gwen Davis. I'm Eileen Pullen. And I worked for Ford's Motor Company making seats. I worked for Ford's Motor Company as a sewing machinist. Well, the grading system at Ford's it was A, unskilled, B, semi-skilled, and C, was skilled. They classed us as unskilled, but in their mind, we were skilled. And of course, men working on skilled work had a much higher rate of pay than we did because we were classed as unskilled. We've been putting our claims in every year when wage claims come in, but they just turned us down. Ford's didn't want to pay women the skill wage. They didn't think we was worth it. We were so fed up of being treated as a second class citizen. We had the meeting in the car park and we decided we've had enough. If we want to do something about it, we've got to 
walkouts. We all put our hands up to say we strike. We went back to our machines, picked up our bags and walked out. The supervision said, well, where are you all going? Oh, we were nervous, but we were determined and nothing was going to stop us from doing it. We had two runs to the House of Commons. There was a coach load of us, 52, just walked up in front of Parliament with our banners. We had to accept the percentage. It was disappointing because you didn't get you didn't get what you wanted, but it was a bit more than what we was getting. But it took us another 16 to 18 years to get the equal pay with the men that we were working with. The skill grade, that was our fight. The skill grade to be recognised. We didn't expect it to be come to that, you know, because it was just for ourselves, really. I didn't feel proud at the time, but I do feel proud now. It was so wonderful when, it, you know, everybody got it, when all women got it. It was so wonderful. What would your advice be to women now? Well, fight for it. If you think you're entitled to it, go for it. you just got to keep fighting. If you feel that you're not being treated properly, you have got to fight for yourself. Go for it, girl. I will stop sharing my screen now. Um, <clears throat> so that was um, some of the four Dagenham women uh, speaking who went out on strike in 1968. Um, most famously, um, their case was made into a movie, um, made in Dagenham in 2010. So this strike was um, said to kind of set off into motion the equal pay um, bill under the guidance of Barbara Castle. Castle argued that the bill offered a practical solution to the problems of equal pay and I quote she said that brings equal pay out of the debating room in, and into recognisable situations in factories, offices and shops and into the black and white of payment agreement, paying agreements. So with that in mind um, I would like to start with um, a discussion about the kind of historical context of the Equal Pay Act. Um, so Jonathan, if you want to come in here, did you interview the Dagenham workers? Thanks Yvonne. Uh, yeah, I, I actually did interview, um, I, I interviewed Gwen and Eileen there and a couple more and then some other women as well who were involved in the the strike that happened in, in 1984, which was the one where they eventually got their, um, their actual skill recognition. And I think that was, that was kind of the main thing that kind of occurred to me when I um, interviewed them was uh, that, that sense that I'd read about this strike in, in, in books and in, in the university library. And um, that I think that this was just as the film was coming out, I think, as I started doing my PhD. And, and it kind of occurred to me if you want, you know, if you went on the TUC website and everything that, that there was, and it's, it's obviously a very famous strike. There was obviously lots of references to it, but it, one of the things that really struck me was just how kind of unaware that they were of the kind of significance of what they'd done and hadn't really thought of it as being particularly historic at the time, which I think is quite interesting. If we're going to think today about the legacy of, of Equal Pay Act and, and how it's kind of remembered and, and why potentially it's not been remembered as or why it wasn't remembered by them potentially as uh, successfully as, as it might have been projected um, certainly in the kind of Hollywood version of, of the film. So uh, that was kind of one of the first things I thought about when I um, did uh, my interviews uh, with them. Um, and I think, yeah, that was the, other, the, the key thing that was, um, that occurred to me as well from, from when you look at um, the 1968 strike was that it was very much focused on this issue of, of skill recognition and something that's also interesting about this is if Ford had carried out this massive um, evaluation scheme um, where they'd regraded, uh, reorganised all the grading scheme within the, the factory in 1967 that had taken years and years of, of planning and uh, the women Prior to that grading scheme that was introduced, where you have the, the unskilled A grade, the semi-skilled B grade, which is what sewing machines were on, sewing machines were on. And um, prior to that, they, they were actually on a, a, a specific women's grade, 
and there'd never been a strike and or that, that had never really been an issue for them. And it was only when they, they were told directly that their work had been recognized as being un, specifically unskilled that kind of lit the match for the for the strike and that was the key thing that that concerned them um was the fact that and, and the the like rhetoric the conventional wisdom that kind of the very simple kind of message of the strike was the idea that there was a somebody going around with a broom um sweeping the floor of the factory Tree and they could like pick up and use that broom at any point, but they that person wouldn't be able to then come and, and use the machine. And it was that kind of injustice that they didn't, they weren't able to understand. Um, and of course, there was this one of the major issues, um, I guess, is um, I'm sorry, I, I think one of the major issues. I'm sorry, I just saw that seen that comment there. Um, one of the, the one of the major issues was that because their strike wasn't over equal pay that they didn't see it as being about equal pay they thought about the, the skill recognition but barbara castle and ford and, and the unions involved knew that it would be it would be absolutely um catastrophic if they were for industrial relations within the factory if they were to to go back and address the the um, job evaluation scheme because everybody else would then start kicking off and, and asking for changes as well and things so they knew that that was never going to really be an option for them at that time. And so that, that was where the kind of Barbara Castle, who'd had pressure <laughs> placed on her as um, the um, Secretary of State uh, for Employment and Productivity, which is something I think we have to remember as well. Like we have to give credit to, to groups like Fawcett Society, Six Point Group, and also Labour MPs, um, as well as Castle herself, like Joyce Butler and Edith Summerskill. Um, so there are people who've put pressure on her um already within uh, the labor party and also of course crucially there's people who wanted to join um the eec as well um who um with the the treaty of rome um if you want to adhere to that uh, you have to accept at least in principle the principle of equal pay um so there are all these other kind of factors that are bubbling away under the surface um throughout the 1960s that I need to kind of think about as well and beyond the 1960s as well um but yeah um, so that's the kind of context, I guess. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll let I'll, uh, Nic uh, Jen and, and Nicole come in on this as well, if you like. Jen, I would come in. I'd quite like I'd quite like to come in a wee bit, and and as well the the women in Dagenham um, remain completely inspiring, and um, their story continues to inspire us all. Um, it, it, it is a bit of a false historical context that's set because actually um, the Dagenham strike which took place um, I think it was May um, that year um, was following a number of strikes that had taken place um, including ones in Glasgow, East Kilbride, Linwood um, and it's lovely to see Agnes represented today, Agnes McLean because Agnes had led the strike in 43 as a 22 year old crane driver, but she spent the rest of her working life fighting in the trade union movement for pay equality, got pay, equal pay into a national bargaining claim with the engineering unions, led strikes in Scotland, um, in, these, um, in Linwood, in, 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 in East Kilbride, in Hillington, organised you know, strategic political strike action. And she represented a generation of women who and the trade union movement had fought for equal pay to become um, a bargaining issue and a political commitment. Um, and so the Dagenham strike wasn't just a moment, it was a product of um, particularly women workers who had fought since the Second World War and beyond and before that also um, to, to seek some kind of um, solution to the the problem of the inequality which was deeply felt by them as workers and the and and I think that Jonathan and the women themselves really express how that felt as a women worker to be treated you know as somehow less worth or less worthy and when you look across at your colleagues and you see that you know you're being devalued and I think that that's something that really rings true about the Dagenham story that many um, women look across the workforce and say, hold on a minute, the work that I do is, is much more complex and difficult, yet I get less reward for it financially. And that's something that, you know, we can take right through. But um, I, I, so sadly, of course, the legislation didn't result in any kind of 
remedy for those women because what those women were looking for were, 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 was that the value of their work was, was graded, not that they were paid um, like for doing similar work. And so the, the law wasn't in fact a remedy and, and the time it took to introduce the law um, meant that lots of inequalities were able to be hidden in disguise by employers. Um, but there's a rich history of industrial action around equal pay. Um, we often don't call it that because we say that women are striking for more pay or better pay, but ultimately the core of their demands are issues about recognition and inequality. And the fact that we don't recognise that means I think that we don't learn the kind of historical um, lessons that we need to learn and that women themselves can't claim the role that they play as fighters in their own struggle for equality it becomes like a gift that others give to them. But often what you do, you, if you look at the real historical context, it has women who have fought and fought industrially um, again and again and again and again, right up to the Glasgow fight for their worth to be recognised in the workplace. Thanks, Jane. There's some really interesting points. Um, Nicole, do you want to come in here? Yeah, just briefly, to, just just to really um, sort of underpin what what the others have said, um, I think it's also really important to to place the the impact um, and the fact that the legislation happened in the sort of the, the context of the social mores of the time. I mean, you know, the impact was great because previous prior to the Equal Pay Act being introduced, under UK uh, legislation, it had been lawful to discriminate against women on in in relation to pay and to pay them less than men for doing like work as well as work of equal value. And, and, and as Jennifer mentioned there, work of equal value actually was something that wasn't included initially in the Equal Pay Act. That came in later and it came in because of uh, European law. Um, so there was this notion um, of which still sustains today in certain areas and, and in certain contexts of the, the breadwinner and a, and a family wage. Um, so women work for pin money. This was the assumption, you know, they didn't really need it. It was a bit of a top up to the family wage, which was earned by men. Um, and it almost for some women felt inappropriate or anti-family to ask for more, even if they were worth more and, and patiently they were, because it was a challenge to the family wage and a challenge to the, the sort of male breadwinner, female carer uh, model. So I think, um, you know, the fact that it, 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 it was on the, the grading issue, that these um, collective acts uh, happened or, or begun to sort of take shape. Um, and that shows really the importance of collectivism. Um, and legislation like the Equal Pay Act, which is you know, not at the time obviously a very important uh, sort of milestone, uh, doesn't really do anything in terms of addressing those structural inequalities and the historical inequalities that women faced and still face, um, because it deals with um, individual remedies by and large. So, you know, it's party party litigation. We can maybe get into that later on, all the sorts of weaknesses of it. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, as, as Jennifer really has highlighted there, and I think Jonathan's work does as well, that um, legislation which gives individual rights by and large to individual women and men, um, is not a replacement for, for collective bargaining. You know, it's not a substitute for collective bargaining and for that collective action, which is really important um, in this whole story. It, it's sewn through the whole story of women's claims to equal pay and their successes uh, in that story. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, everyone, uh, for some really interesting points. So everyone has, um, uh, mentioned the uh, uh, European Union um, underpinning. So, I mean, uh, does anyone want to speak a bit more about the kind of how the EU, um, well, the EEC um, underpinned the kind of, like, the Act and what the Act was intended to do? Um, does anyone want to start with Nicole? Do you want to continue on that? Yeah, I could start on that um, and, and, and the others can, can definitely add to anything that I've got to say. Um, so, I think Jonathan mentioned the Treaty of Rome, which did have a provision for equal work for equal, equal pay for equal work. Um, it wasn't there 
in any way because, because the founding fathers, and they were fathers, they were men of the EC, decided that they, want to do, they wanted to do something to improve women's law. It wasn't there for that reason. It was there as an anti-competitive measure or an anti-competition measure, actually, because some existing member states or some of the initial member states already had provision for equality of pay, um, France notably, in their, you know, their pre-existing uh, employment uh, law. So it was seen that if, if it wasn't made part of the original treaty, then member states who could pay lawfully pay women uh, less than men for doing the same work or work of equal value um, would be able to undercut those member states that had that provision. So that's why it's there. So it's important to remember it's there. The EU has given us a lot in terms of equal pay and equality legislation. Um, and we can maybe come back to that towards the end because I think one of the big threats to this whole area is Brexit. Um, so it's, it was important, it got it there in the first place uh, in the member states um, legislation as a sort of prerequisite to them joining um, the European community, um, but not there for any reason to do primarily with, with gender equality, which I think tells its own story. Um, what we didn't do in the Equal Pay Act initially was to provide for work of equal value unless there was a job evaluation scheme in place. So we had like work, which I think Jennifer mentioned, that's work which is the same or broadly similar. You're entitled if you're a woman to claim on that basis with your male colleagues. And we had work which had been evaluated as part of a job evaluation scheme, which might be different work, but where the value under that scheme was held to be similar or, was, or all the same, close enough. But if you didn't have job evaluation in your workplace, you couldn't use the Equal Pay Act initially. And so this, this was found to be an issue of non-compliance with EU or EC legislation, um, sort of treaty legislation. So we had to change that. We had to amend the Equal Pay Act subsequently to add that provision in. And that really opened the door. I mean, don't get me wrong, this, you know, making claims for same or similar work is, is really important and it's still used today. That issue hasn't gone away because we have legislation, but the equal value provisions really opened the door to all sorts of largely collective action um, of the type that, that Jennifer talked about and, and that we heard from actually from the women in those, in those clips. Um, and this has been really important because it can do something to mitigate those structural issues. It's not the whole answer and I can go on all afternoon, I won't do that, and bore you about the weaknesses of the legislation, but it at least gets to some of those structural issues, which I think is really um, important. So um, yeah, the, the EU has been important in shaping equal pay legislation um, up until the, the current day, and I think that trajectory will continue in the European context. Sadly, um, what, how much we'll benefit from that in the, in the UK, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Thanks, Nicole. Um, does anyone want to, uh, Jonathan, do you want to say anything about, I mean, what were you finding with the European context or we could move on to this idea of equal value? I mean, how did that, how did you find that articulated in perhaps the 1984 campaign or? I think, yeah, the only thing I was just going to add, I think there was, it was my understanding that because it was only kind of in principle, it was in principle and it was relatively tokenistic, this idea, that, um, that you should have some form of commitment to equal pay. It meant that actually within France and the Netherlands and, and Belgium, they, they actually had relatively low levels. Um, they didn't have their high gender pay gaps there as well during the 1960s, I think. And, they, and um, ultimately they weren't enforcing the legislation all that um, effectively. And that was something that made them kind of debate. That was something that kind of held up but were featured in debates in the 1960s about implementing the legislation and there was also concern about what how you would measure equal value as well in terms of like do you look at and are you like comparing um between workers in different industries are you comparing between workers in different parts of the country in different factories within the same industry and it basically i think provided some ammunition to the cbi i think that's something that we also need to think about when looking at the history of equal pay is looking at the arguments that are put forward by those people who who oppose it and so for example the cbi there and lots of conservative politicians are reject and, and, and employers are, are rejecting the idea of having equal pay and they would they would draw upon arguments about well how do you measure a concept like equal value and say this is this is very difficult how, how is this going to actually work in in practice and um 
in, in to have been able to make those arguments that it helps them being able to kind of stall the process i think and and, and absorb and um, sort of absolve themselves from responsibility for it i think as well um so i think that's perhaps another kind of related point that this this kind of a, this question of equal value is something that potentially um stalls um the labor government in the 1960s from implementing the equal pay act uh, perhaps sooner than they, they did um so yeah I'll, I'll leave it there for now i think i would just like to um, maybe add about how um suddenly we start to look at the issue of occupational segregation and the way that women's work is undervalued so suddenly when we talk about value it, it brings into the um, and to play the fact that women who work in predominantly female dominated groups are, are undervalued and particularly Julie Hayward's case in 1984 I think illustrated that really well where 22 year old um, cook in the Camel and Laird, Laird shipyard and um, supported by her union the TNG compared herself after doing her apprenticeship and seeing that she had the same amount of years to study as the young men she was working alongside but they received a significantly higher rate of pay when they qualified in their apprenticeship and her union, the TNG, took that case. And it was seen as a really important case in terms of, uh, of, of, of covering the new ground of equal value. And suddenly, in the, um, as women workers, we could think about, well, how do we rate value for the work that women do as cleaning and, cook, as cleaning and catering and caring and all this female dominated occupations. And, we start to see lots of collective cases as Nicole talked about and um, you know we start to see cleaners and hospitals combine together to put collective cases in and um, we start to see some women um, in the trade union movement try and champion and, and 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 not without difficulty I have to say this was not an easy job for them but to try and champion a strategy around tackling um, the low pay that women's work um, has to endure by taking equal value cases but I think um, we can only reflect on what a absolute failure that's been because here we are in the middle of a pandemic you know absolutely depending on the work of these women and they continue to be the lowest paid in our society you know there's no doubt that that was unsuccessful and I think that that at some point that was largely to do to the same techniques that employers had used when the first piece of legislation came in which is that they then contrived techniques and ways in which they could pay men more money for doing men's work but not make it that obvious so we see the introduction of the bonus particularly in manual work as a mechanism um, to keep you know women's pay down not to bring women up to an equal rate but to keep their pay down um, and so employers and employers organizations and in fact the arms of the state and local government etc um, start um, looking at m methods in which they can deny women equal value in the work that they do um, and 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 then that that becomes the next layer of fight which is about transparent pay policies you know so that we, you know let's let's look at how women can claim the value of the whole pay packet but ultimately i think there was a point that was raised earlier which is about the diagonal women jonathan and you raised that when they knew that they were being treated unequally for a lot of women workers they don't know about the bonus that men who are working in manual jobs are receiving they don't know about the additional hours they don't know about the extra kinds of pay that are going into the their colleagues pay packet and so they have no idea that that injustice is there um, and and not enough um, to put the fire in their belly so that they can you know take whatever power they have to say no and to claim what's theirs and i think that that's one lesson that we need to continually ask ourselves about you know where is the agency of the women workers you know and 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 what how do we make these unfairnesses this um, inequality transparent so that women can make choices about what they want to do about that about whether they want to you know combine take industrial action um, and and use all the powers and tools that they have in their hands as women workers to challenge the what the policies of their employer so um equal value was seen as a real opportunity but it took us down the same path as had been
previously um, undertaken by after the first legislation. But what I think it did do is it highlighted the the principle of value. Um, and it made people think about that more deeply and carefully and, and, and in some ways created an industry around that, actually. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jen. Yeah, so that's really interesting. You've, you've moved me on to my talking points. Um, yeah, so I mean, that was something I thought we could talk about is, is so if we've, if we've got this idea of equal value. So we have like for like work, which um, you know is important um but if we think about equal value and like you were saying like the gendering of women's work so the kind of work that women do um how does the i suppose so i'm asking well, how does the equal pay act kind of help or does it hinder that kind of assessment or and if we could move on to maybe the, the equality act in 2010 which i believe absorbed the equal pay act I mean, does that fix any of these problems or are we still looking at the same issues? Um, if anyone wants to come in there? Nicole? Nicole? Yeah, I, I can come in. Um, so equal value, yeah, absolutely. Um, opened up the range of, or the scope, if you like, of, of what's possible under the, under the, um, the legislation. Um, and it's been used, as we've heard, very effectively by trade unions, in, in, in all sorts of uh, case law, in, in multiple claims. Um, but it, so it assists, it assists in that way, um, as Jennifer has spoken about in the valuing of jobs, but it doesn't really, um, you know, we're still looking at individual claims. You can't, bring a, you can't bring a group action under the equal pay legislation. You can bring a multiple claim. So trade unions can join, if they have the information and they have the membership, they can join those individual claims together so that um, where well, you know one claim goes into the tribunal if it's one then the other claims are settled on the basis of that but you still don't have the opportunity to join together and bring a group claim in the way that you do in other countries and, and that would really help i think with some of these structural issues around um, inequality generally not just to do with pay but certainly in the issue of pay so that's one kind of weakness that has been carried into the equality act um, Moving on to the Equality Act, yeah, you, what, what you say is right, it largely replicates the text of the Equal Pay Act, which is not very long. I mean, the Equal Pay Act wasn't a very long, extensive piece of legislation. It's quite short, doesn't have many provisions. Um, so the Equality Act takes that text, replicates it, consolidates it, joins it up in the framework with other pieces of equality legislation but they don't really speak across the act to each other so it doesn't really do anything to integrate them and that also would have been very helpful um, so it sits there in separate sections if you like of that new uh, or now 10 years old equality act um, and it largely replicates what what we had before codified the, ca the case law in some respects so some of the case law that had already been decided and that was being used to interpret the equal pay act was codified in the Equality Act. So that may, may be, you know, the law better or clearer, if you like, if, if you wanted to use it. Um, including the case law, I keep coming back to it, of the European Court of Justice, which has been quite progressive in this area. Um, and, um, and that was codified as well at, at the point that the, the, the Equality Act was introduced. Um, what, what has it added? It hasn't really added very much. The, the most recent thing it's added is gender pay gap reporting in 2017, which is where employers with 250 plus uh, employees are asked to report on their gender pay gap. Um, this is useful information, but it doesn't necessarily, I mean, I think it's in some ways a bit of a red herring and it can be quite a negative thing because what it does in some respects is employers will say, well, look, my pay gap is narrowing. So that means I've eradicated inequalities in pay. And it doesn't show that because we're talking here about average, you know, pay. So you take the, the sort of collated figure uh, of what you pay to men and what you pay to women and you compare those. That doesn't tell us anything about the detail of what's going on underneath that in different areas of the organisation and in different types of, of job families. So it's helpful, but it needs to be much more um, transparent. I think it needs much more detail and it needs much stronger sanctions. At the moment, the sanctions for non-compliance or not closing your gap 
are really non-existent. So that's the most recent addition that we've had to the kind of suite of law on equal pay. Um, but the Equality Act really, um, yeah, it was an opportunity to do more, I think, than it did do in this area. Would have been great to see group actions, would have been great to see some integration of the different provisions speaking to each other. That didn't happen. They're all there, but they're all quite siloed, um, in my view. I think it was quite helpful to reflect on the experience of um, maybe the Scottish women who worked in local government and when you think about the 2010 Act because you know they, there they were um, expecting um, paid justice in 2000, period of 2006 onwards with regards to the bonus that had been um, a glaring play, pay inequality um, and that, that, that had been sought to be addressed through single status of Scottish local government. And thousands and thousands and thousands of women raised claims um, with campaigning lawyers, with their unions, um, to seek justice, including thousands of women in Glasgow who raised those claims. Um, and they, the employer um, in Glasgow City Council, if you look at you know, how, how the legislation affected them, well, it impacted not a jot and they, are, um, uh, uh, they were still able to conceal inequality, to conceal um, information, to not examine thoroughly the, the consequences of the pay scheme that they introduced and whether it did in fact deal with the inequalities um, that it sought to or whether it actually created more inequality. We had a, um, an, a, an investigation into Glasgow City Council in 2009 that reported in 2011 and we weren't allowed to see the report. So the arms and of the state, you know, in terms of you, the people who were sent into police inequality and pay inequality, um, that was a kind of silent um, and secret deal done. So that if any inequality was found in Glasgow, that was certainly not shared um, with the employees who were seeking pay justice. So the, tw the 2010 Equality Act just seems to have absolutely no impact at all in delivering pay justice for women all over the UK um, and it, it certainly didn't arm them with any extra tools um, and uh, what it did is create a reporting um, requirement from employers as, as Nicole said which they could hide behind quite off quite honestly they could say look how wonderfully we're doing and, and the data provided did not give you the information you needed which is who are you paying bonus to how much are those people earning for doing that job um, and, 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 and highlighting that so people could take claims out so I, I think and I think the remedy issue is enormous actually the, the consequences of not being able to claim collectively are huge for working class women the remedy issues are enormous because the remedy is well, we'll just get give you what you should have got. But in fact, how many cases of pay equality result in the remedy which the court would give them, which is right, we're going to put your entire workforce up to the male level? Almost none at all. That almost never happens. The law is never executed in the fashion that it was designed um, to, to, to deliver justice for workers who suffered unequal pay. So I, I think that the, the Equality Act and the technicalities around, effectively around trying to achieve equal pay through the law, um, you know, that, that's, uh, and I, I think that for feminists and for, for women who are trying to seek progress, um, that becomes almost um, something that puts them off course because we get caught up in these technical arguments you know, of, of calculation, when ultimately the core question about whether women's work is valued sufficiently in society, the work of care, of cleaning, of catering, you know, the work that women do, whether it's sufficiently valued, um, the tools of the state are never used to address that issue, which is ultimately the massive issue for women workers. Um, so um, I, I, I think that the 2010 Equality Act, um, the important um, regimes brought virtually nothing to the table, it certainly didn't add any um, any tools to our toolkit in Glasgow. Um, and I know that there's a few people on the call who were part of that legal team 
who could testify to that, um, both Unison and, and Action for Equality, who fought hard at, at, at the... In fact, we had to fight in, in 2013 with Dumfries and Galloway Council to get the right to compare classroom assistants to Dumfries and Galloway other manual workers. We had to fight in 2014 for the rights for catering and cleaning and care workers in Glasgow City employed by Analio to be able to compare themselves to the binmen employed by Glasgow City Council. We had to go to the courts to seek that level of recognition that those women workers should be able to compare themselves to other workers that the council employ. So, um, it, the, the road is very difficult in 2010, didn't make it any easier for women workers. Thanks, Jen. So, Jonathan, um, thinking about, I suppose, I'm going to go to the Glasgow case in a minute, but thinking about the kind of historic cases um, using the Equal Pay Act, I mean, do you think there's, I mean, do you see any of this, these kind of issues in these cases that you looked at? Um, one of the things um, that I was thinking about, um, one of the things I was wondering about with the, um, so I just going back to the Equality Act there, and others will know more about this than me, but was I was thinking, is it not also not just problems of legislation, but then how it's um, kind of implemented? And it's my understanding that the coalition government in 2013, did they introduce like a £1,200 fee, I think, for um, bringing um, cases forward, I think, um, for that would put people off. Um, doing it in the first place um, and uh, then the other thing that I was going to think about in relation to previous strikes historic strikes in relation to this question about value of work is the extent to which like hands quite a lot of power and control over to um, people who are responsible for implementing the job evaluation schemes and how it raised questions so the, the one of the main reasons why the um, the forward sewing machines took so long to get the skilled nature of their work recognized was because they had to essentially prove that the people who'd evaluated their skills had had discriminated against them on the grounds of the fact that on, on, on the grounds of their, their sex so they had to basically prove that the job evaluation scheme itself was was sexist which i think took an awfully long time and was difficult to to implement in in practice um so i think that was something that uh, that's something I always think about in relation to, um, again, thinking about this question around the value of work and it's how it is potentially quite, um, just in terms of like thinking about, we have to like think about the norms, the different norms and assumptions that inform those judgments, I guess, um, and which was clearly an issue in the, in the, um, in the 1970s um, as well. And, and, you know, a lot of the, the, I mean, the reason why it was important then was because that, when the act was passed, there was a, the majority of um, people, um, Jen, you had mentioned earlier, the, the problem of low pay. And uh, this was one of the major reasons for the, the, the pay gap at that time was because of this gender segregation of labour and the fact that all of um, the, the majority of, I think it was, it was the low pay unit, you have these, these um, campaign uh, and activist groups and um, anti-poverty oh. activist groups that emerged in the 1970s that increasingly draw attention to the fact that um, people who are working in these low paid jobs are predominantly uh, women and uh, and so it's about trying to recognize the value of that work that they're, they're performing and having that kind of recognized as well I guess so yeah, there's a few things I've kind of gone, gone on for a bit of a ta weird tangent there um, but I think uh, yeah the key point I guess I was making was thinking about the subjective assumptions values and assumptions that assume that, that inform um, job evaluation schemes and things. Thanks, Jonathan. So we're nearly nearing the end of the time um, before we move on to questions. So we've just got, I suppose, one last thing I would want us to think about was, um, I suppose, the kind of future of equal pay. Um, uh, I know the Fawcett Society have launched a campaign to modernise equal pay, and, and part of that campaign is about um, transparency in the uh, pay grades. So they did some studies and they found that four in 10 people don't know that women even have the right to ask for equal pay. Um, and uh, they didn't know that they basically they don't know what each other make. And that's a big issue that um, has been touched upon today. Um, and just to pick up on what you were saying, Jonathan, um, with the pandemic, 
just now, obviously, what's going on here um, around the world. Um, it's basically the UN are estimating that, you know, women are going to be worst hit because they do work in these kind of vulnerable sectors that are kind of more um, kind of fragile, I suppose, to um, the, the impacts of the pandemic. So in the context we're in now, I suppose, I mean, can you think of ways in which we could move forward on this issue of equal pay? Is the Fawcett Society suggestion that if we have more transparency, it helps people move forward? Or does it have to be, I know we've picked up on this idea of collective, does the legal law have to be changed to allow for collective action? Um, so just some final comments on that. Uh, do you want to start us off, uh, Nicole? Or? Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, I can start on that. I think I think that's transparency and knowledge is key. So, you know, one of the stumbling blocks, as we've heard already, is that, you know, women don't know you, to bring a claim. You, you've, you've got to have a male comparator. You've got to be able to show some kind of um, inequality. And if you don't know it's, it's uh, the, that it exists and how, you, how you're going to show it, how you're going to get that evidence that you need actually to bring a claim. So that's got to be key. So I think the Fawcett Society's campaign is a good one. Um, but there's so much other stuff that we could be doing and should be doing around this. I think the legislation really needs review. It hasn't been reviewed in a long time. I noticed that Stefan put in the in the comments, uh, the chat box, that Bob Heppel had unsuccessfully tried to carry out a review turned down by the Labour government at the time of the equal pay legislation. That was around or, or pre to prior to the, the, the Equality Act. That was correct. And, and some of the suggestions that Heppel made at that time um, still hold true. Some of that is to do with transparency and knowledge, but also to do with how you get to these kind of structural problems using legislation, which is, as I said at the beginning, uh, individualistic party party. So it's, you know, one woman uh, suing her employer uh, subject to all sorts of constraints. It's very technical. I said the Equal Pay Act was quite a small piece of legislation, but the technicality that's grown up around it mean that actually lots of equality experts or employment law experts, lawyers, I mean, won't take equal pay uh, cases because too technical. You need a lot of technical knowledge to be able to, to succeed in those cases or to know how to make the arguments. That should not be the case for something which is to do with wage equality for women. It shouldn't be the case, particularly, you know, this long after we first uh, introduced legislation. So there's loads of stuff there. But I'll just finish by saying, in my mind, this is part of a whole package of things that needs to happen around women and work. Um, and you can't just pick out pay on its own. So there's lots of discrimination, widespread issues to do with discrimination in the labour market, um, to do with pregnancy, maternity, to do with part time and full time work. Covid will highlight all of these problems that exist. Um, I think Jonathan mentioned uh, employment tribunal fees. They've now been, um, for, the, for the moment, they have been got rid of following a challenge to the policy. But I know that the Westminster government are keen to uh, look at how they might be able to revive them in some way. So they may come back and that's going to be problematic. And the big issue for me is that those other forms of, of inequality that sit alongside equal pay, things around sexual harassment, violence against women and girls, if we don't get to a point in society where we have real equality in all about all, all aspects of our lives, I don't really see how we're going to be able to do very, unfortunately, how we're going to do very much about equal pay. It doesn't mean we shouldn't keep up the fight. And a lot of that um, seems to be within the, the domain for the reasons that we've spoken about of collective uh, action, and so um, we should really be encouraging everyone to join a union. And if you don't have a union, try and get one in your workplace. And if you don't have recognition, try and get recognition. The, the, it really matters in all of these areas. It's the, it's the only way that we can use the law to join things up in any effective way, um, in my view. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Jen, you want to go? Sure. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with joining a union. Um, and, and, and I would say join a union and talk to other women and men in the union about pay equality and build alliances because what we definitely see in Glasgow is that if you collectivise and if you organise and if you put women at the very centre of that and the leadership of that, then that creates an incredibly powerful industrial force. 
and we need a bit more of that, but we also need alongside that in a parallel um, strategy, um, the confidence um, and the commitment to pushing the barriers of the law, you know, so that we identify cases where there are weaknesses and we put resources into pushing those cases. And then we use those cases to push for many more other workers like the workers that win. So, I mean, I hope that Glasgow will be an inspiration to catering and cleaning and caring workers all over Scotland to start thinking about getting organised and how they can use their unions as a lever. But also, I have to say, I think that, you know, we've got quite complacent in Scotland around equality. You know, you know there are civic organisations around the table with the Scottish Government. There's a lot of patting on the back that goes on. But there's very little change that happens for working class women. You know, the powers of the state that that government funds and organise are the ones that create the inequalities for women through privatisation and tendering and casualisation of women's work. They have the tools to remedy all those things, but they don't use the tools to do that. Um, the equality duties on the public sector are incredibly weakly applied. And if we had a rigorous approach to that through the Scottish Government, through local authorities, there is much more that they could justify doing to raise the experience of women's work and pay across those key sectors. So I, I think that, you know, as, as in the women's movement, we've got to raise our game for working class women, you know, and we've got to put their experience much more to the forefront of, 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 of where our ambitions lie to improve their pay. Um, and, and we've got to popularise this issue and so in the way that women understand where pay inequality is in their pay packets. So, you know, ask them the questions of, ask your brother, ask your boyfriend, ask, ask the guy across the street, how much do you get paid? You know, and find out if there are comparators that you know of and consider what your worth is and talk to your colleagues about fighting back around that. So. I would say very much our lesson in Glasgow is that we need to put the power back into the hands of women workers. And if you're an ally um, in the issue of pay equality, you need to be part of, of, of the gang of people that help that happen. Um, so that, 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 that would, that, in terms of um, the women's movement, in terms of the Scottish government, and in terms of local authorities also. So, but I'm terribly optimistic, I have to say, about the example in Glasgow and what it's shown could be done. And what we don't want to treat it as is a one-off, like Dagenham. We want to understand it as a part of an important you know, movement in, of women workers and where they have brought us to, so that we can think about um, what our next target should be. And we can use the trade union movement and the women's movement to try and um, move forward on the issue of equality. I mean, in terms of COVID, um, you know, it has absolutely exposed the, the, the inequalities that are there, but it's also exposed the lack of action, you know, around that. You know, we've, we, we, we're having to force people to pay sick pay to people who are working in care homes and dealing with the most vulnerable in our society and the risk in their lives to do that. We're having to force companies who the state, through local authorities, have a contract with to behave properly, then we're not using the tools of our governments to ensure that women's work is valued and treated with the respect it deserves. So we must do better. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Jonathan, do you have any last comments for us? It's quite quite difficult to follow that. There's some excellent, amazing points there. And I completely agree with the um completely agree with, with everything that's just been said. Um, and both Nicole's point about joining the union and, and, and shifting the emphasis to um, collective action over kind of individualistic responsibility. And perhaps one thing I would just say that I completely agree with Jen with is in terms of perhaps you might also want to think not just in terms of structures, but also maybe just trying to change norms and, you know, making it become increasingly normal to actually ask other people what, what they do get paid, in fact. And, you know, working with younger people and, you know, just raising people's awareness that um, it's not simply a, a result of, um you know direct discrimination if you like there's sometimes this quite simplistic understanding i think of what equal pay is and it's important to try and challenge that and question that and, and encourage uh, young people in particular to try and um, question that and challenge some of these uh 
stereotypes, I guess, about uh, what men and women's work is and, and the different roles and the way in which that's, that's valued. And I think that's, crucially, that's ultimately as well something to think about in terms of the Dagenham strike. I think we might think of that as an outcome of a change in, in cultural norms and ideas about, about gender roles. That not only was there an outcome of, of a change in norms, but also produced a shift in norms as well. And, in, and served as an inspiration for many other female trade unionists and changed the way that, uh, and, femini and, and middle-class feminists as well. And, 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 and so that's something that you might want to think about where you, where you suggested oh, it's, it's ensure the strike wasn't, is not a one-off. You've got to also think about the legacy of that strike and how well, we're still here talking about it today beyond fi uh, 52 years later or whenever. So that's something you might want to think about your own strike as well in terms of how that represents this, this inspiration of, change norms as well I think so yeah that's what I'll say to that. Thanks very much Jonathan so that concludes our roundtable section of today so I'm going to switch off the recording